So today's presentation is entitled MECFS Involves Brain Inflammation Results from a Ramsey Pilot Study with Dr. Jared Younger. Uh, as a reminder, our Ramsey program uh, is SMCI's approach to bring new researchers into the field and give them pilot funding to generate data that will enable them to apply for a larger grant uh, to advance research in MECFS. We are thrilled to be joined today by Jared. Um, he is, he directs the Neuroinflammation, Pain and Fatigue Lab at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. He started studying MECFS in 2011 and the results from that initial study were critical, <coughs> excuse me, in directing his focus to inflammation and neuroinflammation in MECFS. He is funded by NIH, DOD, as well as several nonprofits um, to develop techniques for diagnosing and treating neuroinflammation, pain and fatigue. As I mentioned, he received his Ramsey Award pilot grant from us in 2016. Dr. Younger obtained his PhD in experimental psychophysiology at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville in 2003, and his postdoctoral fellowships in pain medicine and neuroimaging at Arizona State University and Stanford. So uh, welcome, Dr. Younger, and please take it away. Thank you. Okay. So I'm... Um, uh, what I want to do today, I just want to take probably 30 minutes to go through this. I, I, as you heard, I want to present the results of a very specific pilot project that was funded by one of the Ramsey scholarships. And this is really about a new way of imaging brain inflammation, which is something that scientists have had a very hard time doing previously. And the whole goal of this is to determine if MECFS is a disorder that involves brain inflammation. Let me make sure. Yep, looks like I've got control. Um, so this study I'm going to talk about, uh, we have we finished it. So we successfully completed this study. So really big thanks to all the MECFS participants who volunteered for the study. We we can't do the research without the human participants volunteering, and also to the healthy controls. They're really important for us to figure out what is distinct about MECFS. We need all kinds of different people to be able to tease that out. So again, a thanks to all the volunteers. Also some really good news, uh, this project, uh, which you completed just a few months ago, this has been accepted, uh, the paper has been accepted by the journal Brain Imaging and Behavior. So that just came through. Um, that is a paper written by our graduate student, Christina Muller, and it's not released yet. So we can't give it out to everyone, but I imagine in a month or two that will become available. And as soon as it is, we'll make that um, accessible to people. So what that means is that the stuff I'm talking about has gone through that peer review process and soon it'll be available to the scientific community and hopefully we'll be able to help other people. So I'm, I'm glad we're finally in a position where we can talk about the results. I can't talk about everything uh, because the journal has to release some of the stuff but uh, you won't miss anything. We just we won't get into the statistics and some of the finer details. Uh, I don't have a lot of disclosures. Uh, again, this was funded by a Ramsey Award. Uh, ad my effort additionally is funded by the National Institutes of Health, and I have no conflicts of interest uh, to discuss on this one. So uh, this project, um, I did present this once previously, but in a very different way. So I talked about this at Stanford a few months ago at the Open Medicine Foundation. And that talk, I focused more on the general story of brain inflammation. In this one, I'm going to dig a bit deeper into the science. And so you get different pieces of information by watching the different talks. So if you want to hear more about why I think neuroinflammation, brain inflammation is driving MECFS, watch one of those other talks. You can go to YouTube and type in how brain inflammation causes MECFS. Um, if you want even more information, you can type in what is neuroinflammation and my video should come up. In those, I'll talk about the cells involved and what the pathological process is. I'm not gonna do that right now because we have other stuff to discuss. The only thing I'm gonna say about that right now is my central hypothesis and the hypothesis of our lab is that when someone has MECFS, they have a disease of brain inflammation. And that's a condition where the immune cells in the brain have become abnormally activated and they're releasing chemicals, perhaps constantly, that cause fatigue and other symptoms like the cognitive disruption and the mood suppression, motivation suppression, perhaps pain and uh, the exertional intolerance. So the rationale why I did this, um, 
<clears throat> everything we do is, is to the end goal of developing new drugs for MECFS. There's no study we do where we're not trying to think about how are we going to develop a new treatment and actually, you know, successfully treat or cure the disorder. The, the goal of creating new treatments is we want to target the specific pathology of MECFS. We don't want to cover up the symptoms. We don't want to compensate. We don't want to say, hey, you're really fatigued, so let's give you these drugs that are going to rev up your sympathetic nervous system and give you a lot of energy because then you have your systems of your body fighting each other. And that's not, we want, not what we want to do. We want to actually remove the pathological process that's causing the problems in the first place. And we want those treatments to be non-addictive and we want them to be safe as well. So I believe the best treatment for MECFS, this is just my hypothesis, is going to be anti-inflammatories that instead of targeting systems in the body, they specifically target inflammation in the brain. So they have the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier and decrease inflammation, uh, perhaps in the spinal cord, but mostly in, in the brain. Um, these drugs need to be developed and that's a very expensive process. And so it's not good enough for me to think that's a great idea. I have to convince other people of that as well because they have to give us funding and when they give us funding, they're not giving funding to other people. So I have to show why we really need to develop these brain anti-inflammatories. And when I try to get funding for that, it, I can't because the reviewers and the funders want me to prove that MECFS actually is an inflammatory disorder of the brain. And that makes sense. You don't want to spend millions of dollars to develop a drug if you're missing the target. So I've been put in a position where I have to prove the MECFS is a brain inflammatory disorder before I can get the funding to develop the drugs to treat MECFS. And so that's exactly what this is for. It's to, to prove that model. And then we have a tool for detecting neuroinflammation. And then we have a way to show when we develop a new drug, how it's working. And that's what people want to see. So to do that, it's really tough. Um, it's, a, it's a tough position to be in because you can't directly access the tissue that we need. You know, unlike inflammation in the knee where you can draw some fluid and, and measure that and know if it's inflamed, it's really tough to do that safely in the brain. So we're kind of limited to brain imaging. And it's true that the brain imaging technology has gotten really good. We can get these really nice pictures like what you're seeing right now. You know, we can fly around the brain and see if there's any kind of, you know, high level pathology but the inflammation is harder to get. You can't see it usually on pictures like this because the cells are microscopic and the processes are microscopic. And so if you actually saw inflammation on a scan like this, a conventional medical scan, that would be big trouble because that means either you have something like meningitis, which is a acute emergency, or you have a tumor uh, that you could actually see. And that's not what we're talking about with MECFS. These are smaller processes that you can't see this way. So we can't look directly at the cells. We can't use conventional medical scans. So we have to use new scans that allow us to detect not the cells, but the things they produce. And so that's what this uh, particular scan is. <clears throat> so let me tell you what it's like to do it. And then we'll go right into what the pictures look like and what information we get and then what that means for MECFS. So, um, the nice thing about the scan, this is a magnetic resonance imaging scan, or it's a modification of that. So what's really nice is that to do the scan, you just go into the scanner, you lay down, we put you in the scanner, scan for about 30 minutes, and that's it. There's no radiation, there's no x-rays, there's no contrast, there's no injections of any type. You don't have to draw blood, you don't need sedatives, you don't need to fast, there's nothing you have to do. And you don't feel anything. Uh, the only thing is that it's loud, uh, but it's a lot easier than other types of scans. Um, the only thing is it's a magnet. So if you had metal in your body, some people can't do the scan because of that. Um, otherwise, it's it's very easy to do. And it's since it's non-invasive, we could do the scan every day if we wanted to in a person with absolutely no problems. And that's really important for testing a drug because we can do the scan multiple times before, during, and after we give a treatment. So when someone feels better, we can actually say, hey, here's why they feel better. It's because the inflammation is being reduced. And a lot of other techniques, you can't do that. So once we do, sorry, so once we do these scans, uh, we get these maps like this. And this shows concentration of different chemicals in the brain. And each one of these squares that you see here represents 
a um, different part of the brain. So what, you, what you we're looking at now is a top-down version of the brain. So kind of you're standing above the person looking down, and this is one slice. And you can see in different areas of the brain, there's different concentrations of those chemicals. You can see spots where these brighter spots where there's a higher concentration of the chemical and spots that are more blue where there's less of that chemical. So we can do that for any of these chemicals that are related to neuroinflammation. And so we can look around the brain and find places where there's actually abnormal inflammation. And that's really important on an individual level. <clears throat> so what we're actually looking at um, inside those squares. So in each one of those squares I showed you, we're getting a lot of information. So it's a very powerful technique. And what we're looking at is this kind of plot that you see right now. It's basically concentrations of different chemicals. So as you move from left to right, those are different chemicals that exist in that little square. And then the height of the peak, how tall it is, is how much of that chemical exists in that location. So we're quantifying different chemicals that are related to neuroinflammation. So to give an example of the ones we're most interested in, um, one is called myoinositol, and myoinositol is a chemical that's found in glial cells, like microglia cells, but not so much in neurons, and we believe that the glial cells are driving the inflammation. And so if you're looking at a part of the brain and you see a really high level of myoinositol, um, that means that the glial cells have aggregated to that location or they're proliferating, and that suggests that there's neuroinflammation. So that's one way we can detect neuroinflammation is there's too much myonisetol, meaning there's too much microglia activity there. <clears throat> uh, another one is choline, and uh, choline is a marker of rapid cell turnover. So cells are being created, they're being destroyed, they're being created again, and in your brain you shouldn't be running through cells that quickly. Your brain's pretty stable in that regard. So if you see really fast turnover of cells, that usually means there's an inflammatory process. And so the higher that choline peak is, the greater uh, the neuroinflammation in that region. Uh, the next one is N-acetyl aspartate. Um, that is a marker of neuronal health. So you want that peak to be really tall because that means the, uh, the neurons, there's a lot of neurons in that region and the neurons are healthy. So we use this to determine if the neuroinflammation is so severe that it's actually damaging the cells, the brain cells, the neuron cells. So if you see that peak start to go down, that means there may be a neurodegenerative problem, such as like you see in multiple sclerosis, where the cells themselves, the, the neurons are being damaged. And uh, the last one I'm going to talk about is lactate. And this is a really interesting one because you usually don't see lactate in the brain. Uh, if you detect lactate, that means that the metabolic processes in the brain have become so fast that they've they've exceeded the blood supply's oxygen uh, ability to feed that metabolism. So they convert over to a different way to metabolize that produces lactate. So just like um, if, if athletes run too fast, their muscles start working so quickly that the oxygen can't keep up, they'll start to build up lactate and they'll get a burn from that. The same thing can happen in the brain. The thing is, is that you can't with normal activity do that. You can't think so hard or so fast that you uh, exceed the oxygen supply. The only way you can do that is if there's a pathological process such as a neuroinflammation or if something happens to your blood vessels so there's not oxygen getting to that location. And we actually do a different scan to rule out the oxygen problem. And so if we see lactate, it's probably because of neuroinflammation. So that's what we're looking for. So the basic idea is we do the scan, we, we scan the entire brain, and we're looking to see if ME-CFS involves abnormal increases in these chemicals. And if we see that, that tells us that ME-CFS is likely a, a neuroinflammatory disorder. Uh, there is some precedent for this. This is the only slide, I think, from other people's research. But I did want to say that in at least three separate times, other groups have found ME-CFS to involve increased lactate they didn't have the ability to look across the whole brain like we're going to. So they looked at the ventricles and this is where cerebral spinal fluid is produced deep in the brain. And they did find increased lactate. So you see here on the, on the right, healthy people have a very low level of lactate. And then if you have chronic fatigue syndrome, that's the second bar, you have much greater levels of lactate in the cerebral ventricles. If you have FM, it's still elevated. And if you have FM, which is fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, it's elevated again. So 
Um, this has been shown before, but in a very limited part of the brain, but still very exciting. Okay, so let's get into the study, look at the results and talk about the implications. So very simple in terms of design. All we, for a pilot study like this, as you heard before, all we want to do is do an initial test. We want to make sure there's something interesting here before we commit a lot of funding into the project. So this is 15 people with ME-CFS and 15 people who are healthy controls. They're all women. So because this is a small sample size, we don't want to add um, issues of variance by having men and women in there. So we just did women only. 15 versus 15, they were very closely age matched, which you can see on this top line. So their ages were very close, that way we don't have to worry about different um, kind of brain stages uh, related to age. Of course, the MECFS group had more fatigue, they're supposed to. Their anxiety and depression was elevated compared to the controls, but it wasn't to the point that would require treatment. So this wasn't a depressed group, it wasn't an anxious group. Um, they were relatively free of that. So what we do is we scan the 15 MECFS, we scan the controls, and we look to see what the differences are and if that supports the hypothesis. And of course, we, we expected to see increased neuroinflammation in the MECFS group. So these are the actual pictures um, that we can produce from this. And I want to go through quickly the different outcomes and tell you why these are important. So first, the choline. Now, remember I said that choline happens when there's really rapid cell turnover. So if we see a lot of choline, um, that, that suggests there's a neuroinflammatory process. We found many areas of the brain, you can see the list on, on the left, where the choline was increased in the MECFS group. There were no areas where it was increased in the healthy control group. And what's really nice about the scan is what you're looking at at the bottom, on the left is a single MECFS participant, and on the right is a healthy participant. So when we do this, you should see basically these greens and yellows. That's what a healthy control should look like. And so if we run an MECFS participant, we see these areas of red, which is choline about uh, maybe two times higher than the healthy controls. I'd have to look at the numbers again to be exactly sure. But you see all these regions um, where there's elevation of choline. Now what's interesting about these regions, when you kind of dig in and find out what those are, those regions are areas implicated in what we call the sickness response. And that's when you when you get the flu uh, and there's inflammation in your brain, there's different areas of the brain that drive the feelings of, of malaise. There's areas that drive your motivation decrease and your general kind of decreased mood, which is what we think is happening in MECFS as well. In particular, this, if you can see this pointer, this anterior cingulate cortex is really important for driving sickness response. And I think I've got a zoom up thing here. Yeah, so in this picture, the person's looking to the right. And what you see in the circle is the subgenual ACC. And this is one of the most important regions in driving just the horrible mood and the lack of energy that you get when you're really, really sick. And so we think this is important in the pathology of MECFS. So just so you know what we're looking at, kind of the scientists when we're trying to compare the groups. Uh, I have an example control at the top. And what we're looking at here is if you look at that choline peak and you draw a line straight to the right, it should go about halfway to two thirds up on what's called the creatine peak. That's normal. Um, if you look at a CFS participant and you draw the line, you see that the choline is as tall or maybe even taller than the creatine peak. And that's what we're looking at when we say there's an elevation of choline. It doesn't take much for you to get into that pathological region. Um, now, sometimes choline goes way, way high, like two to three times the creatine peak. If that happens, that suggests something else. That suggests that the cells are turning over so rapidly that there's probably a new tumor there, so, uh, some kind of neoplasm. And so that's a totally different issue, which would require a, a different response. That's not MECFS. So you can get more information than just MECFS from that. But this is what we're looking at about choline, about this level, is suggesting it's kind of in that neuroinflammatory range. All right, the next one is lactate. And lactate was elevated throughout the brain in MECFS. It, it was the one that had the most regions that were elevated. And let me orient you to this. Um, at the top, the left is our 15 MECFS participants. 
in the right are the healthy controls. And what we want to focus on is kind of the internal parts of the brain. And you can see all these areas of red in the MECFS participants. These are all areas where the lactate was about four times higher than the healthy controls. And um, one thing I want to point out is, is on the healthy controls, there's this strip on the outside that looks like elevated lactate. That's actually a problem with the skull messing up the scans on the very outside of the brain. So we're working on that. That is probably not a legitimate lactate. So we're ignoring the outside, but just focusing on the inside stuff here. And these regions, and the same thing down here, this is a 15 MECFS participants and healthy controls. And we're looking at all these red spots where there's increased lactate. These regions are really important for the sickness response. And so I wanna just take you through a few of these. Um, we see the increased lactate again in the cingulate and that cingulate cortex is what is where all the, the malaise and the depressed mood and just, just general feelings of uneasiness, that's the area of the brain that mediates those feelings. And so the fact that we see uh, inflammation uh, in that area, I think makes a lot of sense for MECFS. Uh, the next region is the hippocampus. Uh, so there's inflammation in the hippocampus. This is where your memories are formed and kind of stored. And so to the extent that people have memory issues, we can't prove this yet, but it makes sense that there's inflammation in the hippocampus that would interfere with those memory processes. Uh, the next one is the thalamus. And this is the switchboard for basically all your processes in your brain, especially the sensations you get from the body. So if someone has MECFS and they have pain as well, or pain sensitivity, or kind of weird sensations, that could be caused by inflammation in the thalamus. And so it's important that we see that here. Uh, the cerebellum had a lot of inflammation, a lot of lactate. And this is where you get your coordination and your psychomotor speed. And so if people feel that they're not as fast or they have uh, problems with coordination, that could be the result of inflammation in the cerebellum. And uh, the last one I'll just show is the insula. Uh, the insula does a whole lot of stuff. Uh, you can see these circles, the front part. So we're looking down at the brain and the brain, the person's kind of looking up to the top of the screen. So this is, the this is where the nose would be, where my pointer is. So the insula does a lot of things as you go from the front to the back. And we haven't broken up the different parts yet. So we need to do that. But the insula is really important again for pain and it's important for anxiety as well. So um, it, can, it can explain some of the physical and some of the emotional aspects of MECFS. So we have this lactate and this uh, choline all over the brain suggesting neuroinflammation and they're in regions that would drive symptoms that we see in MECFS. So all the stuff is fitting together really nicely. Now, um, we also looked at myoinositol, and I'm not going to show that because there was not a lot. We did not see many areas of increased myoinositol, and uh, we looked at N-acetyl aspartate, which was that marker of neuronal health, and I think only one region had decreased NAA, and um, it wasn't a logical reason, so uh, a region, so I don't think that's a legitimate finding. We did not find much evidence of decreased uh, N-acetyl aspartate. I think that's a good thing because to me, that means despite the neuroinflammation, there's not neurodegeneration. So the neurons still look healthy despite the inflammation in the brain. That's good news because, you know, inflammation is one thing, but if you're actually killing or destroying the neurons, that's a whole nother issue. And that's the problem, again, you have with multiple sclerosis. And so because we see that the neuronal health looks good, this scan may separate something like MECFS from something like multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, where you actually have um, cell death, neuronal death. So if you ever hear me say in any of the papers, low level neuroinflammation or low level brain inflammation, all that means is that there could be a lot of inflammation in the brain, but it's not so severe that it's damaging neurons. That's all I mean when I say low level inflammation. So the last thing we were able to do with the scan is good brain temperature. And this is this one's really neat. Um, I'm glad we were able to get this to work. Um, we can get whole brain maps of real temperature in each one of those squares. So, you know, you can go through the brain and find cool areas and find hot areas. So this is a healthy person. They're looking, this, their nose is over here. So they're kind of looking this direction. And we can see that the outside of the brain is relatively cool and there's warm spots as you get deeper. What's 
the reason we do this is similar to why you would take temperature in the body. As there's more inflammation, the temperature goes up. So our brain runs a little hotter than our body, and that's because it's trapped inside the skull. There's nowhere for the heat to go. And, and also because our brain takes up most of our energy. So there's a lot going on in our brain. It builds up a lot of heat. The only reason our brains don't, um, excuse me, don't overheat is because our blood from our body circulates through and cools it off and tries to get the brain close to our body temperature. And the blood comes back out and then dissipates throughout the body and, and leaves. So our body cools off our brain. What we think happens with neuroinflammation is those metabolic processes are going so quickly, they generate too much heat, more heat than can be adequately dissipated. And this happens with, with some other diseases like tumors as well. And so we build up too much heat, the body can't cool it off sufficiently. And so you get a buildup of heat in the brain. And when you get a buildup of heat in the brain, it starts to cause symptoms of cognitive problems, um, balance problems, mood problems, uh, and, and basically the symptoms of MECFS. So we want to know if there's elevated temperature in MECFS. That would also suggest neuroinflammation. Uh, the short answer is yes. We found many regions where there is abnormally elevated brain temperature, about one degree Fahrenheit higher in MECFS than controls. Some people have much higher than that, but I'm just talking about on average. And these regions, which you see over here, there were basically five regions that we found with elevated brain temperature. And what's really interesting is three of those five, the uh, insula, the cerebellum, and the thalamus, were regions where we also saw increased lactate. And so now we're getting different information, different ways of looking at neuroinflammation converging on the same regions. And those are, all three of those regions are implicated in the sickness response. So this is really important information where, where we're saying that you know, both the chemicals and the temperature that would suggest neuroinflammation are pointing in the same direction and all pointing in the direction of neuroinflammation and MECFS. So this worked as well as I would have hoped. Um, you know, we didn't know when we did these scans that it was going to turn out like this, but it certainly supports our hypothesis that it did. Uh, I do want to point out real quick that MECFS is not, uh, does not involve elevated body temperature. Um, if we take body temperature of MECFS participants, some of them will be spot on normal, some will run a little low, some will run a little high. Uh, there's no relationship. So the brain temperature has been detached from the body temperature. So you can't take body temperature and really know what your brain is doing, unfortunately. So really the only way to do it is through the scan. Um, a few other things. So one of the important things about the scan is we it has to work where we can distinguish someone with MECFS from other people with fatigue and with pain. And it seems to be doing that quite well. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Um, it, first of all, it distinguishes MECFS from rheumatoid arthritis. So I picked rheumatoid arthritis because that's an autoimmune disorder and there's a lot of inflammation in the body. And they also have very high fatigue, oftentimes like eight out of 10 fatigue, quite high. But when we do the brain scans, we don't find a lot of evidence of brain inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis. So right here you see lactate in healthy controls. The second group is the amount of lactate in um, rheumatoid arthritis. And then we have the people with chronic fatigue syndrome. And so the chronic fatigue syndrome is clearly different from both healthy controls and rheumatoid arthritis. And so the scan may separate people with pain and fatigue where the inflammation is in the body versus when the inflammation is in the brain. And that's really helpful. And then another example is this. We uh, just finished a project with a traumatic brain injury. And what you're looking at here is 15 people with moderate to severe TBI. So they had really bad head damage and it, and it impacted their brain. And this is about a year after their, their concussion or, or their traumatic brain injury. It was actually more severe than a concussion. So pretty severe injuries. And then you have a control group. So these are people on the left who had a, had a brain injury and they still are suffering from that and they have fatigue and other problems. And then you have healthy controls. And this is myoinisetol. So what I like about this is when we looked at traumatic brain injury, even though they can have symptoms like MECFS, the pattern of neuroinflammation is completely different. So first of all, it was mostly myoinisetol, which we didn't see so much in MECFS. And really excitingly, it didn't involve the cell bodies, the, the neuron uh, gray matter, it involved the white matter. And that's the, the parts of the neurons that connect the different areas of the brain. So in the brain, we have gray and white matter MECFS seemed to be a problem with gray matter, 
predominantly, whereas traumatic brain injury was a problem with the white matter, which is consistent with some other literature. And so again, the, the upshot of this is we are getting to the point where as we run more people, you could give us someone, we could run a scan, not know anything about them, and we can get better and better at saying, looking at the scan and saying, oh, this is a person who has traumatic brain injury, or this is a person that has MECFS, or this is a person that doesn't have neuroinflammation at all. And that's really important for diagnostic purposes. So as we run more and more and more people, we get more confident in interpreting individual scans. And that um, that gets us to the point where it actually could be adopted clinically and used diagnostically, which is something we hope happens. Okay, so treatment. Um, what do we do about this? So let's say we're right. I think the evidence is suggesting this is a neuroinflammatory disorder. What does that mean? What's what's the next step? So how do we have a targeted treatment? So basically, if I'm trying to figure out what to do in the brain, we can start by looking in the body. If you go to your physician or if you go to urgent care because you have horrible inflammation, let's say you, you hurt your knee, it's all swelled up, um, it's, it's interfering with your ability to get around and probably causing more harm than good, you want to get that inflammation down. The physician's going to tell you to do one of two things pretty much. The first one is you can take anti-inflammatories, so drugs that halt or reduce the inflammatory process in your body, or you can put ice on it because cold uh, interferes with the processes, slows down the metabolism, and halts the inflammation. Those are both very effective. Everyone knows this. If you have inflammation, you take anti-inflammatories or you put cold on it. So we use that as a starting point. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about the treatments. I just want to kind of throw out why this brain imaging is so important. The treatments would be a, an entirely different talk. So to look at those two, the first one is, can we develop a drug that works just like these drugs work in the body, but they can cross the blood-brain barrier and directly target the unique processes in the brain that's inflammation, but they differ a bit from what's happening in the body. Now, as I said before, there's no FDA-approved drug that does this currently, so you cannot go to a clinician and ask for a brain anti-inflammatory drug. There's nothing marketed for that purpose. Um, however, there are drugs that were designed for other purposes that seem to do this. Um, if you ever hear me or someone else talk about low-dose naltrexone. Uh, again, I'm not suggesting this is a treatment. This is just uh, literature. That is something that has shown evidence to decrease brain inflammation. Also, low-dose dextromethorphan. Uh, I'm not even going to give dosages, but very low-dose dextromethorphan evidence suggests that that also reduces brain inflammation. So one of the things we're doing is looking at these drugs that you can take right now and testing them to see if they reduce brain inflammation. We also just completed a study in September, looking at nine different botanical anti-inflammatories. So these are different herbs like uh, and different spices, things like curcumin and a boswellia that we're now analyzing to see if they reduce brain inflammation. Just a sneak peek, this is all I can say, but I ran the first statistics yesterday uh, in the afternoon and I tested the first four botanicals and two of the four had a significant impact on fatigue and pain. So that's really exciting. I don't even know what the botanicals are because we're double blinded. I do the analyses and then when we're done, we find out which which was which, um, but they are working better than placebo. So we're trying to attack this from all different angles. So I do think central anti-inflammatories are gonna be the key to MECFS. And maybe there's existing drugs or existing botanicals that'll help. I think ultimately we're going to have to develop new drugs to do that. And, and of course, that's what we're doing. So the other one is the brain cooling. And just have a couple more slides. We're almost done. Um, the brain cooling is an interesting approach. It kind of makes sense. If you, have, if you have a hot brain, if you have elevated brain temperature, if you have inflammation in the brain and that's causing your problems, can we cool off the brain? The short answer is we don't know in MECFS because the clinical trial has not been conducted. However, there is a, a large precedent for cooling the brain to reduce inflammation. The military does it. You see it in sports. You see it in neonatal care. Um, for example, in sports, if someone's playing American football, they get a really bad con concussion uh, from, from a bad head strike. They will cool their brain on the sidelines before they even get to the hospital to reduce that acute inflammation, which saves uh, some of the neurons from being damaged. So we certainly know that you can effectively cool the brain to reduce inflammation and improve disease. The only issue is that 
to my knowledge, this is always done as a, an acute emergency. That's how it's FDA approved. I have never seen it used for chronic disease. Now, maybe it has. I'm just not aware of it, but it's certainly not a, a, a popular thing. So we would have to work out if it's being used chronically, how cold do you get it? How long can you use it? How long can you use it safely? And so there's all these things we'd have to run a clinical trial. So I couldn't tell people to go out and try to cool off their brain. Uh, we just don't know the parameters for that to be effective. The other problem is it's, it's actually very difficult to cool the brain. You can't just put ice on your head. That'll cool your scalp. There's no way it'll penetrate the brain and it's impossible for it to penetrate the deep parts of the brain. So the medical devices, as you see this picture on the right, uh, it involves constantly circulating coolant. There is a skull cap, which cools the outside part of the brain, but the really important piece, if you see this piece around the neck, this actually cools the blood supply as it moves up from your heart through your neck to your brain. So that's the way you cool the blood that's getting to the deep parts of the brain. It'd be very tough to cool off your entire brain without that. And there's just no um, commercial device for this. It's only medical. So um, this is something we could look at. Uh, we could test this. And then if it looks effective, there may be ways to develop it where people could use it at home, but it's just not there right now. But but again, it is interesting and it is possible that cooling the brain could help. I just can't recommend it yet. Uh, last thing I'm gonna mention is vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, this is something that has not been tested in MECFS, but when you put a vagal nerve stimulator uh, or you put a stimulator on the vagus, that uh, we know that produces anti-inflammatory chemicals in the brain and that can counteract the inflammation. And so it's possible that um, you can do this vagus nerve stimulation, decrease inflammation in the brain, and that could help MECFS. I would put that as, as something that's worthy of, of testing that has not been done before. The reason I haven't done it before is, is conventionally you have to implant the device and you have to kind of clamp it onto the vagus nerve. And it's just so invasive that I didn't think it was worth it. However, now there's at least one company that has a non-invasive vagus nerve stimulator. And uh, if that works, then that makes it much more easy to use. You could, you could put it over the vagus, stimulate it, cause the anti-inflammation in the brain, and maybe improve symptoms. But again, we have to test it first in clinical trials before we can recommend that. So let me just close with uh, really quickly what happens next. Um, the bottom line with the scan is it worked as we hypothesized. There's clear evidence in many brain regions of inflammation in MECFS. I think the results are very interpretable. They make sense. They're very reasonable and they're robust and consistent. So these, these are good results to get from a pilot project and it definitely justifies running in a larger group of people um, to, to, to learn more and, and to make this available to other groups. So right now, just based on our studies, this one and others, I am still confident that MECFS is a brain inflammation disorder. I'm always willing to change that opinion if I get information that counters my hypothesis, but so far the hypotheses have been supported. So the next steps, number one, we have to run a lot more people with MECFS. You can't say anything with 15 people. It's just not enough. Um, so we're trying to get federal funding to do this on more like 100 people. And if we can run 100 people with MECFS, then we'll have some really solid information I think we can actually use. So that's step one. Uh, the other thing is I'd be interested in running clinical trials of the brain cooling, the vagus nerve stimulation, currently available medications. And so we're trying to prioritize which ones we can do, get funding for that, and see if we can develop any of these for effective treatments. And now that we have the scan, when we do these clinical trials, we can add the scan to it and show the brain inflammation being decreased when the person starts the treatment, which is really nice. And then the third major step is we're trying to get um, funding to develop the new drugs. Um, these are things that have never been used in humans before. That's the hardest one, and that's the one that costs millions of dollars. So that's usually um, federal um, agencies like NIH that gets that started. But it's something we might as well work on in parallel with the other things, because I think that's where we're going to get the greatest impact. So that's kind of the areas we're working at. And um, yeah, happy to take some questions and discuss uh, how this may be relevant to people with MECFS. Thank you so much, Sherrod. That was really, really fascinating, uh, great data, and 
as always, when I see you present, I am constantly assured of what an amazing research and how thoughtful your, the design of your studies um, is. So we have a few questions which have come in over the, um, the question feed. The first from Catherine, can you tell us how severe the ME CFS participants selected for the pilot study were? Yes. Um, so the, the fatigue level was just under 60 out of 100. So I would classify this as moderate to moderately high. Uh, these would not be classified as very severe. All of them were able to come to the laboratory uh, on their own. And so they were not uh, bed bound. They were not homebound. So again, talking about upper 50s to 60 fatigue. So moderately severe levels of MECFS. Okay. Thank you. Um, a question from Mark. Do, do you have any mechanism to tell apart the different isoforms of lactate, so the D and L forms of lactate in the MRI? We do not. Unfortunately, the uh, the magnetic resonance spectroscopy technique we use cannot possibly do that. I've been trying to, it's very fascinating. That could be very informative. I don't know if there's a different way of doing spectroscopy with a different coil that might allow us to do that. But um, right now, the technology does not allow us to do that. Okay, a question from Maria. Does your hypothesis of neuroinflammation help explain the range of symptoms in MECFS, for example, sound sensitivity? I think it does, yeah. So, so the thing, I've, I've said this in other talks, once you have inflammation in your brain, that has the potential of impacting anything. And because we see this lactate so widely distributed, it's not like we're only seeing it in one little brain region that controls, you know, coordination. And then it would be specific. We're seeing this kind of widely spread and it's impacting so many brain regions that really um, you could explain pretty much any symptom with that. And what I try to tell people is the range of symptoms that's predicted by this is the same range of symptoms that you would get if you have a really bad flu or mono or something like that. So all of those symptoms of malaise, lowered motivation, cognitive stuff, um, uh, pain, sensory disruption, sleep disruption, uh, all those things can be explained by uh, inflammation in the brain. And we know that because if you take healthy people and you inject them with something that activates their central immune system, uh, we can use something called endotoxin to do that. You create all of those symptoms. And uh, hypersensitivity to sensory um, stimuli is definitely one of those. So that, that is a classic um, sickness response that's caused by inflammation in the brain. So, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Kathy. Would an activated retrovirus be a potential trigger to bring about these findings? Yep. So, um, there's a lot of potential causes, and it's important to note that this does not tell us why the brain is inflamed. That's the missing piece. That's what kills me. I really want to know the cause. Um, in fact, you know, we ran 15 people it could be that they all have brain inflammation, but they have brain inflammation for different reasons. It could be that some of them have some kind of autoimmune disorder that's activating the centrally, and it could be that some of them have any number of uh, viruses or bacteria, uh, mold, fungi, other pathogens that have taken residence somewhere in the central nervous system, and they're fluctuating. They're coming out, activating the immune system. They're getting suppressed, and they're coming back, and so it's this constant battle between an entrenched pathogen and the immune response. All of those would look the same on these scans, and so that's the first step, identifying there's neuroinflammation, and then what's the additional test we can do to find out why in that particular person, the brain is inflamed, because I suspect it's not the same story for everyone with MECFS. Okay, thank you. Um, if a patient was in a state of remission, would you still see evidence of neuroinflammation in the same way that you would if a patient was in relapse? And that's a question from Marianne. So my guess is that this will correlate very well with how the person feels. And so, no, these chemicals, uh, should be wiped out very quickly. They should not sit around. So if we find it, that means they've been produced probably in the last few minutes. And so if a person is in relapse and their symptoms are worse, we should see a lot of these signals elevated. And if for some reason they feel great, I would expect their brain would look like a healthy control. That's just my guess. We haven't done that. It's a really interesting question. And if we can get the um, uh, federal funding, a piece of that is to scan MECFS participants on 
two good days and two bad days relative to them just to ask that question, are these signals elevated when they feel really, really bad? And that's an important piece of information of knowing if the brain inflammation is actually driving or closely related to the symptom severity. Okay, awesome. Um, what do you think about proposed neuroinflammation connection in other conditions like Alzheimer's or autism? And is there anything that can be learned from those studies that can be applied to the work in MECFS? Yeah, uh, certainly the other way. So now that we've developed the scan and I've talked to people about it, um, and, and actually I have to say that the, you know, the scan was was uh, developed by a group out of Miami. Uh, Andrew Modesley is the PI, and he's he's made it very easy for us to apply this technique. But now that we've shown this, done this whole brain, and shown it in a condition like MECFS, we're being asked to teach other people how to do it so they can test pediatric disorders and, and things like Alzheimer's and things like epilepsy and, and other neuroinflammatory neurodegenerative disorders. So I like that because the more data we get in these different conditions, we can see the degree to which the diseases are the same or different. I do want to say that, you know, neuroinflammation and brain inflammation, that's a very broad term. There's different ways you can get that. So I don't want to suggest when I say MMPCFS is brain inflammation, Alzheimer's may be brain inflammation as well, but those are very different diseases, and we can't go into the details of that right now. So they've got, they're related in this way that the microglia cells are being activated and producing chemicals, but that's about the end of the similarity. So as we scan the different groups, yeah, it'd be very interesting to see if we can get a distinct pattern for each one of these brain disorders. Uh, in terms of the reverse direction, I don't know. I, I don't... Um, I keep an eye on those literatures. I look at Alzheimer's research and things like uh, autism and things like epilepsy. So yes, if I see something, a new tool, a new blood test um, that looks relevant, then yeah, I'll pull it over and try an MECFS. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we had a question about whether or not you're sharing your methodology with clinicians or other people who may be seeing MECFS patients um, as a way to be able to determine a diagnosis? Yeah, um, so right now we're share, share, well, of course we'll share it with anybody who wants it uh, and we'll help them. It, it is a bit of a technical challenge to convert the machines over, uh, not hardware really, but there's a lot of programming involved in getting the scans to work because it's kind of a, it's an extension of conventional scans. So we use MRI scanners, but you have to do a lot to get all this chemistry stuff. It's not what they originally kind of set up to do. But um, mostly researchers have asked us and several have done that. And so if they ask, we'll show them how to use the software. We'll help as much as we can to get the scanner to get the right information. Um, the people who have asked us have been clinician scientists. And so that's really cool because they do both. There are physicians, they have patients, uh, but they also do research. And those are the first people who would logically want to take this try it in research, and if it looks good, they'll bring it over to their clinic, and that's how it starts, and it spreads from there. So yes, considering we've only put out our first paper, um, and it's not even published yet, we've gotten a lot of attention, and once these papers go out, I think we'll be asked a lot, and that's great. We'll uh, do everything we can. I think Andrew Modesley at Miami will help however he can, and we'll get this spread out, and then maybe uh, a little bit down the road, it actually will become a clinical scan. Okay, great. Um, you talked a little bit about some of the expanded work that you were hoping to do with additional funds from the NIH. Do you, will you be looking at the impact of degree of severity and correlating that with degree of inflammation? Yep, absolutely. So that's a great question uh, and absolutely important to do. We, we want to be able to show that the worse off someone is, the more inflammation that is. And that just helps add information about how these things are tied together. Um, I didn't show it, but uh, we did do that in the paper that comes out. And so we do these scatter plots where you kind of see as your fatigue, self-reported fatigue severity goes up, some of these inflammatory signals go up. And so I, I don't like to do that with 15 people, but if we run 100 people, absolutely, we can do that quite easily. And that will be one of the primary things we'll try to determine. Great. Um, how can um, physical exertion increase brain inflammation? Do you, have you done any research into that or do you have any hypotheses as to how those two things could be correlated? 
Yeah, um, I have not. I've never done um, physical exertion tests like other people do. They'll do the two hit kind of the exercise bike tests and things. That's a very interesting paradigm. I just haven't adopted it. What we do is we give people, um, oftentimes we, we do blood draws, but we let them hit their natural kind of symptom exacerbation things at home and we just measure them. So we don't do it experimentally. Um, I have to think about that because I don't really think about um, physical exertion and how that exacerbates symptoms. I'm trying to relate it back to, you know, if you have the flu again and you can barely get off the couch, if you try to run, you're going to be completely decimated. If you could, in fact, you couldn't even do it. And so I know there are um, inflammatory routes that make that basically impossible. Uh, but I have to think about that a little bit more about why when you try to exert yourself, you exacerbate these symptoms. I mean, a couple possibilities are the microglia cells may be reacting to chemicals produced by the body and they're interpreting that as a signal of a problem when they're not supposed to. Two examples, one is beta endorphin. And so you've ever heard of endogenous uh, endorphins, endogenous opioids. When somebody runs, for example, it puts their body under stress. And so the body produces beta endorphins that um, lower your blood pressure and actually can make people feel good. I have a suspicion that in ME-CFS, it actually does the reverse. And if you exert yourself and your body produces beta endorphins, that actually aggravates the uh, uh, microglia cells and causes you to feel sick. Uh, so if that's the case, it would be um, kind of a very perverse twist on how the body is supposed to work. And the reason I think that may be the case is because when we give low-dose naltrexone, which blocks the opioid receptors on the microglia, that can oftentimes make people feel better. So um, endogenous opioids is a possibility, and cortisol is a possibility as well. It could be just the stress of the, of the exertion, the microglia responding to the cortisol instead of decreasing their activity. When they detect that cortisol, they increase the activity. We have not tested either of those but those would be the first two I would look at. Okay. We have a related question that's come in from Malaf Trevetti, who is also a researcher looking at, um, you know, brain and neuroinflammation and glial cell mm -hmm. activation. The question is, how would the glial cells versus the neuronal cells respond to low-dose next? Ne <laughs> Sorry, I'm the, butchering the, the pronunciation. Uh, low-dose naltrexone. Yes. So um, so the problem with lotus naltrexone is it's not specific in its activity. It hits neuronal cells and it hits microglia cells. And that's actually one of the problems that limits, I think, its clinical efficacy. We want it to hit microglia cells to reduce the inflammation. And it does that, but it also hits what's called mu opioid receptors on neurons. And that actually decreases your body's pain fighting abilities. And we don't want to do that. Um, now at the low dose, it seems to hit the microglia more than the neuro, uh, neurons. And so that's our compromise. If you give a full dose of naltrexone, you completely block the person's endogenous morphine or endogenous opioid system, and that's not good. They will feel bad when you do that. So you can't give a full dose. That's why we give the low dose, because we think the microglia cells are sensitized. And so we can kind of get away without blocking the neurons completely. The answer to that, uh, the best solution, and uh, I'll just mention this very briefly. One of the drugs that we want to get funding to develop is a form of naltrexone that only impacts the microglia side. And I've been talking about this for a long time. I, I'm as interested of it now as I was years ago. We, it just takes so much money to get that moved over and tested in humans. But that form of naltrexone that doesn't touch the neurons, that would allow us to increase the dose, but only hit the microglia. And I think that's ultimately going to be one of the important treatments for MECFS. Awesome, thank you. You're getting a, a lot of, not really questions, but comments about how great this research is and how um, appreciative people are that you're pursuing um, these avenues of research and, and really dedicating your time to, under, to better understanding what's going on in these patients. So I just wanted to share that before <laughs> we move into our last question. Um, and this is actually from me and Alison here in the SMCI offices. 
but we we often uh, talk about your work as a great example of why it's important for us to provide seed funding through the Ramsey program and we know that you've also been instrumental in bringing another Ramsey researcher Dr Liz Worthy into the field I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, that relationship and how you're going to be sharing samples to really try and accelerate research and, and collaborate to learn more faster yeah yeah of course um, so that's at the uh, Hudson Alpha Institute and Liz Worthy uh, and Camille Birch are going to be running that. I'm really excited to see that. In fact, we've already started sending them samples, recruiting new people and sending those. It's a really good example. You know, all the different scientist teams, they're good at different things. And if they work by themselves, you know, they can do the thing they do really well, but the best projects may not come out of that because they're deficient in other areas. So in this case with Hudson Alpha, they they do incredible genotyping stuff that I can I can barely understand. But they basically have the ability to just run a small number of people through the, their algorithms and through their testing and determine are your symptoms likely related to some unique um, genotype that you have. And that stuff I have no idea how to do. What I do know how to do is um, help MECFS participants who definitely have the disorder because we screen them and we do so many blood tests to rule out other things, we can get a really good group of people who definitely have the disorder and to give blood that we can then send to Hudson Alpha and they can do their tests. So it's a great collaboration. I focus on the on the human side, get the really good samples, get a lot of information on the people, and then they run their very highly technical genotyping um, analyses to come up with their unique approach. And so What's nice is what they do is so totally different from mine, but we can combine that information ultimately. So, you know, I could take people that we did brain scans, they could do genotyping, and then down the road, they may find that half of their people had a particular genotype signal that's actually related to our brain inflammation, and that information comes together and gives us more than you could ever get with one lab alone. And, that, and so I think cracking the problem may come a lot faster as these different groups share information as much as they're able to you know there's barriers we can't just throw data out to everyone there's rules we have to follow but i think uh, as we see these more collaborative projects uh, like the one we're doing with hudson alpha that's going to really advance uh, the knowledge quickly